Pokemon Scarlet and Violet have finally arrived, and with the ninth generation of Pokemon in the year 2022, Game Freak is finally dipping their toes into the open world genre. With that comes a first in the history of Pokemon, non-linear progression through the game's main story. In fact, the game's main story is actually split into three smaller, somewhat related storylines. Victory Road, which challenges players to defeat eight gym leaders, Starfall Street, which has you facing off against five bosses of the evil Team Star, and Path of Legends, where you'll seek out and fight five oversized Titan Pokemon. In the end, there are 18 badges to collect in total, one for every type of Pokemon. But the order in which you collect those badges is entirely up to you. The entire world is open, icons for each badge are placed on your map from the start of the game, and it's up to you to explore the world and collect all 18 to complete the game's main story. So of course, what was the first thing I did when presented with a non-linear path through a Pokemon game? Well, I drafted up a linear path through the game, of course. An optimal, correct path, if you will. Much like the Mega Man games, you could face the bosses in any order you wish, but there is, in fact, a correct order based on level. So that's what I'll be doing today. Having completed the game and taking vigorous notes, I've created this correct path through the game. I'll show you the easiest way to get all 18 badges from start to finish by assigning a value to each trainer based on the level of their strongest Pokemon. I will also outline each trainer's full party, giving my thoughts and tips on each and my overall experience taking down each of them. I'm gonna avoid story spoilers entirely, but if you want a completely untainted list of all the trainers from start to finish, easiest to hardest, skip forward to this time in the video to see that list. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to divide the video into three parts for each of the three storylines. This is the order I played the game myself, Victory Road first, then Starfall Street, and finally Path of Legends. In the end, I'll gather up all the data and present the final list every trainer we talk about, from easiest to hardest, intertwining between the three stories when appropriate. Let's not waste any more time and get right into it. Also, this is like day one, so if I accidentally mispronounce any of the names in this video, you could just send me a quick clip at correct pronunciation at I don't give a crap about fake monster pronunciations dot but. With that, let's get into the video. The very first gym any beginner should tackle is in Cortondo. Katie uses Bug-type Pokemon, Nimble, and Tarantula at level 14, and her ace is a level 15 Teddy Ursa with a Bug Terra-type. I'm not going to go over the type chart over and over for every trainer I cover in this video, but the Bug Terra means Fighting-type moves go from super effective versus Teddy Ursa to not very effective against this Bug Teddy Ursa. Review your type chart, kids. Just keep in mind there's usually some kind of logic between the Pokemon and Terra type combination gym leaders are using, either to cover weaknesses or enhance their offense even further. The bottom line is, every gym leader has a type, and they're going to terrestrialize their ace into that type. So you're looking to counter bug types here at this gym. I always choose the fire starter when I do my first playthrough of a new Pokemon game. I always have, I always will. So by the time I reached Katie, I had already evolved my Fococo into a Crocolore, and at level 16, I was able to make easy work of this gym leader, soloing the entire team with Crocolore. Next up is the Grass Gym and Brassius, who rocks a level 16 Petalil and Smoliv, and has a level 17 Sudowoodoo as his ace. Hilariously, Sudowoodoo would, you know, hard counter my fire starter, but instead, against all logic, these gym leaders will always terrestrialize their final Pokemon, no matter what type matchup they're going up against. So instead of running into a tough Rock-type Pokemon, my level 20 Crocolore annihilated the Grass-type Sudowoodoo. Clearly, the Fire Starter is the best choice if you want to wreck the beginning of this game. We head to Lavincia next to face Iono, the live streamer, the content creator, the legend herself. In classic Pokemon fashion, they play this whole angle way over the top, and I gotta say, I really got a kick out of her dialogue and little mannerisms. They are clearly poking fun at the YouTubers and Twitch streamers with this one. I mean, content creators aren't actually this obnoxious, but in the context of a Pokemon game and a gym leader, it works really, really well. Now, before we continue this video, I just want to remind you to smash that subscribe button if you want to keep up with all this sick Pokemon Scarlet and Violet launch 
coverage. I have a ton in the works, so be sure to ring that little bell so you know the microsecond a new video has been uploaded to the channel. Also, don't forget to smash that like button. Let's try to get to at least 63,000 likes on all of these videos. Otherwise, I'm going to starve and I'll have to get a real job. Anyways, Iono's specialty is electric type Pokemon. She has a pretty solid little party here with a level 23 Watrol, Belly Bolt, and Luxio, and a level 24 Miss Magius as her ace. At this point, I was already starting to encounter more powerful wild Pokemon, including a beastly level 25 Paldean Tauros. One double kick was all it took to take down Miss Magius, and the battle was done. Can I please get some Fs in the chat for Iono? Next up is Kofu, who I found was the first real challenge of the gym leaders. He has a level 29 Veluza and Wug Trio, and a level 30 Crabominable as his ace. My habit of going from one gym straight to the next with little to no training almost bit me in the ass here. My entire team was below level 30 with the sole exception of my Crocolore, so I was definitely under leveled here. However, I was able to grind it out through sheer numbers. My team of six was able to chip away at his team of three, and thanks to a clutch miss, I was able to deliver the final blow with my last Pokemon. That was close. Next, we have the leader of the normal gym, Larry. I absolutely love this guy. Look at him. He's so boring. The perfect, normal gym leader. He has a level 35 Komala and Dadun Sparse, and a level 36 Star Raptor as his ace. I was way underleveled going into this gym, but I did have a little trick up my sleeve. This is the first truly open world Pokemon game, right? So I took advantage. Between gyms, I found myself exploring the world just to see what I could find. Lo and behold, a level 50 Scyther appeared. Just for fun, I chucked an Ultra Ball, and wouldn't you know, I caught the thing. I now had access to a Pokemon 20 levels above the rest of my party. Of course, a level 50 Pokemon is not going to obey me consistently until I get my hands on six badges, so I didn't build my strategy around it or anything like that, but it's nice to have in case luck goes my way. Ultimately, my battle with Larry was pretty straightforward, chipping away at his three Pokemon with my six. His Staraptor actually made easy work of my Scyther, despite being 15 levels stronger. Turns out super effective moves really hurt. Ultimately, my Arcanine was the one to clutch out the win with extreme speed. But I knew for the next gym, I was going to have to grind at least a little bit. Montanavera Gym was next, which is located on a snowy mountain. And in Pokemon, snow can only mean one thing. Ice type Pokemon. It wasn't long before my Crocolore evolved to Skeledurge, and I felt ready to take on Rhyme, the ghost type specialist. She came at me with a level 41 Mimikyu, Banette, Houndstone, and a level 42 Toxtricity as her ace. Also, the goodest boy was in the audience getting hype. For whatever reason, this is a double battle. I'm not sure why. But either way, the result was the same. My level 41 Skeledurge absolutely crushed the entire team single handedly. Time for gym number seven. Also before challenging Rhyme, in the gym lobby you'll receive a lucky egg, so if you're struggling with any of the trainers in this video, be sure to get your hands on this valuable item. Lucky eggs are key in any Pokemon game, and by giving it to a Pokemon to hold, it will level them up much, much faster. Next up is Tulip, who owns her own cosmetic company, and fights with Pokemon on the side for some reason. Her psychic team consists of Ferrigiraffe, Espathra, Gardevoir, and a level 45 Florgis as her ace. That is one pretty team. I was laughably overleveled going into this battle because, believe it or not, Tulip was the final gym leader I faced. Indeed, the freedom of this new Pokemon adventure was on full display as I accidentally faced the final gym leader a bit early. At this point, my super OP Scyther finally started to obey me, so I was able to destroy pretty much her entire team with x -Scissor. Destruction. The eighth and final gym leader is Grusha, the Ice-type specialist. As I just mentioned, I actually faced her seventh and was super underleveled, but my Terrasilized Skeledurge, combined with Torch Song and Flamethrower, was enough to take down her entire team, despite the level discrepancy. Her team consists of a level 47 Frostmoth, Beartick, Sititan, and a level 48 Altaria as her ace. I'll admit I had to use a revive and some hyper potions to keep Skeledurge healthy, but hey, I broke the sequence. I'm taking that W. With that, we have the eight badges from the Victory Road storyline, but we are far from done with Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's overall story. 
Before tackling the endgame trainers for Victory Road, I knew I was going to take down the other two storylines first. Let's shift gears and head down Starfall Street, where we literally get to fight some cars. The first of the Team Star bosses you should fight is Giacomo, boss of the Dark Crew. I'm going to outline the complete correct path order at the end of this video, but basically you're either going to fight this dude near the very beginning of the game, or you're me and you've already defeated the 8 gym leaders and have a party of Pokemon in their late 40s. So in my case, I completely destroyed Giacomo's Ponyard and Revavroom. No matter what, this is not a hard battle and shouldn't cause you much trouble. Next up is Mela, leader of the Fire Crew. Mela was actually the first Team Star boss I battled in the game right after defeating the second gym. With a level 27 Torkoal and a level 26 Revavroom, I was definitely not adequately prepared for this fight. I took down Torkoal with Crocolore just barely, and now it was time to fight that damn Starmobile. Now I'm not sure exactly how the mechanics change for these fights, but the Revavroom functions more like one of the boss battles in the game, like a Titan or a Terror Raid fight. It gets the big life bar with no specifics on how much HP it has. I can only assume all of its stats are buffed far higher than any normal level 26 Pokemon, because I was only able to chip away at its health little by little no matter what moves I threw at it. This was not a pretty fight, but thankfully most of these Starmobile's moves were not very effective against Crocolore, and with the use of some potions, I was able to outlast the thing after a long, long fight. Another sequence break complete. Kinda. Up next is Atticus, leader of the Poison Crew, who brings to battle a level 32 Skuntank, level 32 Muck, and level 32 Revavroom. Again, I faced Atticus after collecting 8 badges, so this was absolute domination for my level 50 Skeledurge. Next up is a huge jump in level from the last fight, and it's Ortega, the boss of the Fairy Crew. I can't say I understand why there's such a massive spike here. Clearly, you can't just play through all five of these Team Star bosses like I did with the Gym Leaders, as Ortega and his team would stop you dead in your tracks after defeating Atticus. He rocks a level 50 Azumarill, level 50 Wigglytuff, a level 51 Dakboon, and a level 50 Revavroom. Once again, my Skeleturge was able to take down most of the team, but I also got my hands on a level 52 Bisharp by this point, who put in a lot of work during this fight as well. Finally, we have Aerie, the pro wrestling boss of the fighting crew, and her team is stupidly powerful. A level 55 Toxicroak, level 55 Passimian, level 55 Lucario, and even a level 56 Annihilate, the brand spanking new evolution of Primeape. After 25 long years, the homie was finally given some love and can evolve. Wanna know how to evolve a Primeape to Annihilate yourself? Don't worry, I'll have a video on that coming to the channel very soon, if it's not up already. Eri rounds out her team as the other bosses do, with a level 56 Revavroom. Believe it or not, I faced this boss way out of order, third out of the five Team Star bosses. My Skeledirge was only level 49, and promptly got its ass whooped. My Dark Steel Bisharp, despite its high level, was specifically designed to be destroyed by this team. My only hope was that level 55 Scyther and a whole lot of potions. Luckily by this point in the game I had stockpiled quite a few healing items and ended up using a ton for this fight. A healthy combination of Swords Dance, Air Slash, and most importantly Hyper Potions allowed me to clutch this one out with Scyther. I could not believe it. What a nightmare that was. Thankfully if you're watching this video, you won't have to struggle against these trainers like I did. Just fight them in the correct order, and you should be fine. With that, we've cleared out the 5 Team Star bosses, and hold 13 badges. Before fighting the elite endgame trainers for this storyline, let's take down those 5 Titans in the Path of Legends storyline. Unfortunately, with the Titan Pokémon, we are not given any specific level. For whatever stupid reason. So the only way we could logically order them is by using the level of Arvin's Pokemon, who will team up with you to take the Titan down during the fight. First up is Cloth, the Rock Titan. When fighting it, Arvin sends out a level 16 Shelter, so that's the ballpark we're looking at here. You should go into this fight with your team at least at level 16. Once again, I already had beaten all of the Gym Leaders and Team Star Bosses by this point, so my team was hilariously overleveled when fighting Cloth. After winning, you will unlock the overworld ability to quickly dash with your Coridon or Miraidon, depending on your version. Up next is the Flying Titan, Bombardier. 
Arvin sent out a level 19 Knackley, which looks like a 1-up mushroom in the Minecraft art style. I like it. What I don't like is when I first saw this giant scary bird attack me, I kind of thought it could work as a Pharaoh evolution. But no, it's just a new standalone bird Pokemon. Pharaoh has been totally ignored since its introduction in 1996, and I, for one, am sick of all the hate. No evolutions, no pre-evolutions, no mega evolutions, or G-Max forms, or regional variants. At this point, the Sparrow line is one of the few in all of Gen 1 that hasn't received anything new for 26 years, and I think it's time this injustice came to an end. Come on, Game Freak, Prime Ape finally got some love. When is Pharaoh gonna get a sick-ass evolved form? Anyways, Bombardier is easily defeated, and you'll unlock the ability to surf in the overworld. Next up is this horrific monster, Orthworm. Arvin sent out a level 28 Toad School to take the Steel-type Titan down, so enter this fight with Pokemon at least at that level. Or you could one-shot it with a level 50 Skeledirge like I did. That works too. As you can probably tell by now, if you leave an entire storyline for last like I did, you're going to absolutely sleepwalk through the entire thing with insanely overleveled Pokemon. Beating Orthworm unlocks the Super Jump ability for your Overworld Legendary. Next up is the Ground Titan, which is going to be slightly different depending on the version you are playing. It'll be a Great Tusk if you're playing Scarlet, and Iron Treads if you're playing Violet. I haven't touched any story spoilers so far in this video, and I won't do so here either. I'll leave it to you to play through the game and discover the startling secret behind this Titan in particular. Why does it look like a Dawn fan? Why does it change depending on the version? So many questions. Arvin sends out a level 44 Skull Villain to help take down the Ground Titan, and defeating it will unlock the incredibly useful Glide ability for your Overworld Legendary. Finally, we have Dondozo and Tatsugiri, the Dragon Titans. Well, technically only one is a Dragon type. This is all very confusing. This final Titan fight has two phases. First, explore the little island in the middle of the lake and fight the little Tatsugiri until you find one yelling at you about a Titan. When you do so, Dondozo will leap out of the lake and attack. For whatever reason, Dondozo is a pure water type, despite this being the Dragon Titan fight. What, they couldn't get a dragon for this fight? Where's Paldean Dragonite? Anyways, after damaging Dondozo, it'll swim off into the distance. Ride southeast to this wall and marvel at the magical giant Dondozo that materializes out of thin air and proceeds to murder your player character. Oh, I guess she's fine. After defeating Dondozo for a second time, you'll get to fight the actual Dragon Titan. Well, this one is a dragon, but it's not really a Titan. Like, not even close? That's no Titan. That thing's no bigger than a Pichu. Anyways, Arvin sends out a level 55 Greedent to help defeat the beast. All jokes aside, this little bugger is high level and surprisingly powerful. It even managed to take down my Skeledirge. But Bisharp cleaned it up, and with this win, all five Titans have been defeated. You'll unlock the ability to climb in the overworld, and all 18 of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's badges are now in your possession. Congratulations! But we aren't done just yet. It's time for the endgame. Each of the three storylines end with you having to defeat some incredibly powerful trainers. Unlike the 18 fights I outlined above, which each focus on a unique type, you'll be facing off against elite trainers here with far more balanced teams and full parties of six powerful Pokemon. Dare I say, some of these fights are actually kinda hard. Indeed, the difficulty picks up here, so knowing what you're up against and tackling it in the right order could mean the difference between victory and defeat. From a level perspective, you should first head over to the Pokemon League to fight the Elite Four. After answering this stupid questionnaire, which you should have the answers to by watching this video, you'll begin by fighting the sharply dressed Rika of the Elite Four, a ground type trainer with a level 58 Claude Sire as the ace. At this point in the game, I had corrected my over reliance on fire type Pokemon with a Gyarados. Can't go wrong with Gyarados. It absolutely destroyed Rika's team single handedly until I got to Claude Sire. Look at this guy. I love him. Unfortunately, he has the Water Absorb ability, rendering my Gyarados' Aqua Tail useless. I had to bring in Scyther, who was level 60 at this point, and one x Scissor was all it took to defeat Rika. Next up, it's... oh boy, it's Poppy. Now, I know this game has a lot of lore about legendary Pokémon and time traveling and all that crap. What I want to know is how this small child has managed to become a member of the Elite Four. That's the lore I'm interested in. 
Like, wouldn't you need some kind of amazing reputation as a trainer to be considered Elite Four? Like, I'm talking years and years of experience. Most of the Elite Four I remember are, like, elderly people. How could this small child attain such a title so quickly? I mean, I'm just baffled here. Ash was 10 when he started his Pokemon journey, and it took him 25 years to finally become world champion at the ripe old age of 10. Poppy can't be older than four years old, and she's already a member of the Elite Four. Ash is a loser, confirmed. Sit down, old man. Poppy is the new future of this franchise. Anyways, don't underestimate the kid. Poppy has a sick team of Steel-type Pokemon and a level 59 Tinkaton as her ace. But she was no match for my Skeledurge and Flamethrower. Aw, oh, look at her. She's doing the finger thing and everything. So I'm gonna get this kid some chicken tendies right now. Next up is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in a Pokemon game. Larry is back and he's working a second job to make ends meet. Even funnier is his Elite Four team consisting of all flying type Pokemon, possibly the only type more boring than normal. I nearly died. This dude is clearly based on the average Japanese salaryman, and he's so awesome. If I ever do a gym leader tier list video for this game, spoiler alert, Larry is S tier, free. His Elite Four team is actually pretty diverse when it comes to typing, and my approach was equally diverse. Pretty much my entire party was needed to take each of his Pokemon down. His ace, Flamigo, may be the first Pokemon you fight that cracks the level 60 barrier, so be prepared for the scary fighting Flamingo. The final member of the Elite Four is Hassel, a Dragon-type trainer with the powerful Baxcalibur as his ace at level 61. You know the drill for Dragon-types, Ice or Fairy is the way to go. Of course, I had no such Pokemon in my party going up against him, so, you know, that's great. The best I could do was Gyarados with Icy Wind and my Dreadnought with Ice Spinner. It was surprisingly effective and Dreadnought especially was able to tank some of those more powerful Dragon-type attacks and take some meaty chunks of health with Ice Spinner. Finally, it was time to fight the Ace. Skeletor landed a Fire Blast, taking about 70% of Baxcalibur's health, but it came right back and absolutely murdered Skeletor. Then Gyarados, then Scyther, then Bisharp. All I had left was Dreadnought. He had to clutch it out, and it did. That damn Glaive Rush left me with two HP, and it was Ice Spinner that put Hassel away. Glaive Rush is a Dragon type, 120 power, physical attack with 100% accuracy. The catch is, if you survive it, your attack will deal double damage on the next turn. I don't think Ice Spinner would have done Baxcalibur away in one shot if it wasn't for that little buff. Long story short, this is a tough fight, and this might be the point where you may have to prepare some of those sandwiches and grind against those chances to get your party at the level it needs to be to keep up. If you're having trouble here, be sure to check out my video on the best spot in the game to grind tons and tons of XP quickly. At last, we reach the champion of Paldea, Gita. There's no type specialty here. Gita's team is totally balanced with a level 61 Espathra, Gogoat, Beluza, Avalug, and that's right, King Gambit, the new evolved form of Bisharp. Want to get one yourself? King Gambit Evolution Method video coming soon to the channel if it's not up already. Spoiler alert! King Gambit is my single favorite new Pokemon in this entire game. He is so great. Gita rounds off her team with Glamora, a Rock Poison type, with a Rock Terra type. Surprisingly, Gita didn't give me as much trouble as Hassel. Bisharp took out his Pathra and Veluza, and Skeledurge did its job against Avalug, King Gambit, and Gogoat. Dreadnought cleaned up against Glamora, and if you got this far, congratulations, you've achieved the champion rank in Paldea, but your journey is far from over. In fact, we aren't even done the Victory Road storyline. The final trainer awaits in Mezagoza, but she will have to wait a little bit. First, we're going to fly to Poco Path Lighthouse in the south and finish the Path of Legends storyline. It's time to fight Arvin. Arvin is an elite champion level trainer like Gita before him. He has a full party of six and no specific type specialty. That makes him dangerous. Also, as far as I could tell, he's the only trainer in this entire video that doesn't follow the same formula when it comes to Pokemon levels. Every single party so far contained Pokemon at the same level, the only exception being the Ace, which was one level higher than the rest. Arvin, on the other hand, 
opens with a level 58 Greedent, and each Pokemon that follows levels up by 1, all the way to 63 with his ace, Mabostef. As a result, I'm going to assign a level value of 60.5 on this guy, which is the average of his 6 Pokemon, instead of the level of his strongest Pokemon. Having finished the game, I think he slots in here nicely, just after the Elite Four and Champion, but before the final three Elite Trainers. No matter what, this is a very tough fight, and is going to require some smart party composition, item use, and probably chancy grinding. I lost two or three times and had to come back later because he was just crushing me. My Skeledirge was able to take out its Greedence after losing Bisharp, but that Garnacle wandered straight out of Minecraft and killed Gyarados. Scyther cleaned him up, and I switched back to Skeledirge to take out Scobillin. Toad Scroll, with its ground grass typing, was an absolute pain for my party in particular. It took out Dreadnought and Luxray with ease, and Flamethrower took 80%, but Skeledirge was promptly murdered shortly after. It was going to be up to Scyther. X Scissor took out Toad Scroll, and with Cloyster sent out, it was time to play the revive game. I tanked a couple of hits and was able to revive Dreadnought, Luxray, and Bisharp. Luxray was able to take out Cloyster with Thunderfang, and now all that was left was Arvin's ace and goodest boy, Mabostef. I revived Scyther, healed him completely, and I was able to land two X Scissors to just barely take out Arvin with my final Pokemon. A lot of luck had gone my way, and like I said earlier, this is definitely the time to grind chances if you find yourself struggling against these top tier trainers. If you made it this far, congratulations, you've defeated Arvin and officially completed the Path of Legend storyline. Next up, let's fly to Mezagoza to fight Clavel and complete the Starfall Street storyline. Clavel's team is an absolute killer. Great type coverage, all level 60s, and worst of all, his ace will be the final form of the starter that is super effective against the one you chose. As you can see, his entire team changes slightly depending on the starter you've chosen. For me, I was going up against a Quaquaval at level 61 as the ace. Like Arvin, Clavel kicked my ass a couple of times before I finally managed to come out with the win. I chipped away at his team slowly, taking out Oranguru and Abomasnow with Skeledurge. Bisharp took down Poltegeist, and Gyarados finished off Houndoom. Scyther took out Among Us, a mushroom Pokemon named in dedication to the 2018 video game Among Us. All that remained was the ace and swag god, Quaquaval. I used Electric Terra on my Luxray to take a solid 60% chunk out of its life, then revived it, healed its health, and used Thunderfang to... miss. Unbelievable bad luck on my end. I had to go through the full revival song and dance once again. Brought Luxray back in, tanked a hit, and used Volt Switch to put Clavel away. Once again, this is a very tough fight. Come prepared with revives and hyper potions, or go grind against those chances. But that is not the end of Starfall Street. The final, final boss is actually Penny. And it's clear from looking at this picture that she is a huge fan of Ekans. Her team consists of six Evolutions, all at level 62, with her ace Sylveon at 63. Not gonna lie, despite the higher levels, I found this fight easier than Clavel and Arvin. I think my team just matches up against Penny's a little better, and the Evolutions, as much as I love them, are kinda weak. They all drop like flies, and it was my Skeleturge, who was only level 55 at the time, taking down most of the team. After beating Penny, congratulations, you've completed the Starfall Street storyline. Only one trainer remains, and she is the final boss of the Victory Road storyline. Nimona is the final boss of the game's main story if you are following the correct path based on level. Just look at this team. Five level 65s and a level 66 ace. Thankfully, that ace is the fully evolved form of the starter you are super effective against. So, you know, that's nice, I guess. Nevertheless, you're going to want a team of level 60s before going up against Nimona, and some revives and hyper potions wouldn't hurt either. I opened with Bisharp and was able to take out Lycanroc, but not before it could use Stealth Rock, which is going to be a pain in the ass for the rest of your team. Palmot was next, it took out Bisharp, Luxray, and Skeledurge, thanks to an unfortunate critical hit. Scyther was able to take it out finally with Air Slash. Before losing it to Gudra, I revived my Skeledurge, then sent out Dreadnought. I knew it could tank a few hits from Gudra and deal out some good damage with Ice Spinner. Gyarados continued to chip away with Icy Wind, but ultimately I was down to my final Pokemon, Skeledurge. I took out Gudra, then one-shotted Orthworm. The Dunsparce, perhaps the least creative new Pokemon of this generation, was out next. 
Thankfully, this is the weak point of Nimona's team. I knew I could start playing with revives and full restores to turn the tables here. I revived Dreadnought, Bisharp, and Scyther. I also landed Torch Song three times on the Dunsparce, which rages Skeletor to special attack every time it hits. The Dunsparce went down, and all that was left was Meow's Garada. I knew if I could get out there with a full health Skeledurge, I could take it out with Flamethrower in one or two hits. And that's exactly what I did. After some back and forth, I landed those Flamethrowers, and Nimona was defeated. If you made it this far, congratulations, you've completed the Victory Road storyline, and indeed, the three storylines that make up the bulk of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. However, there's still a little bit more game left, but that will have to wait for another video. Coming very soon here on the channel, we'll take an in-depth look at the super secret final boss of the game that can only be challenged after completing the three main storylines in this video. And boy, is it a doozy. For now, here's a quick summary of today's video and the full, correct path through the game from lowest to highest level and swinging back and forth between the game's three storylines. Of course, the choice is ultimately up to you. If you want a bit of a challenge, you could attempt some of the harder fights earlier in the game. If you think you have the right team to take down one of the higher level trainers at an earlier point in the game, I say go for it. I did it a couple of times and it was a lot of fun. While it's not perfect, I think Game Freak did a pretty good job here with their first real attempt at an open world game and non-linear progression through the main story. Anyways, that is going to wrap it up for today's video. If you like this video and want to see more Pokemon Scarlet and Violet launch content, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel because I have tons of videos in the works right now that will be rolling out over the coming days. But that's it for today, so until next time, thanks so much for watching everyone, and take care.